generally speaking, there has been a great shift over the last number of years on the perspective on God. We have gone from a culture where God was greatly respected to now there being a culture war on God. There has been a declaration of war within our culture on God. What does this mean for us? Is this important? Should this be something that is on our radar? Does it really matter? May I suggest that it most certainly does. This edition of Keeping It Real is going to be very important in analyzing a culture war on God. And believe me, it is there. It hasn't taken much to identify it. It is very real. And we are going to hone in on how this thing has evolutionized and intensified and magnified over the last number of years. So won't you keep it here to keep it real over the next hour. Are you ready? 
by the Katinas. And if you are listening to this and watching this on YouTube or Facebook or some other aspect of social media, I certainly hope that you are ready. Indeed, if you are uh, born again, uh, a born again Christian, been born again by the Spirit of God, I certainly hope and pray that you are indeed ready. We all need to be. And this edition of the show I've entitled The Culture War on God. It is for real, especially with everything that is going on in the current time. When you think of how all the ways that um, those that have an anti-God agenda that really uh, don't look upon kindly or with any kind of spirit of humility at all, with any kind of respect upon anybody that names the name of Christ, they are definitely out for us. There's no doubt about it. And how are we to handle that? How are we to respond? What should our perspective be? We're going to answer all those kinds of questions here in this edition of the show. But here from the jump, what I want to lay out is how this culture war on God has even gotten going. How do we know it's even gotten going? I mean, is what I'm saying here for real or am I just, you know, kind of blowing smoke? I want to assure you that this is no blowing smoke example. We never really do that here on this outlet known as KIR Radio, and this is going to be no exception here on this edition of the show. When we want to consider, or when we think about uh, considering the culture war on God, we want to analyze how indeed this war has intensified, because it most certainly has, okay? There has been a clear culture war on God, and the thing is, are we going to be people that stand firm, or will we be casualties of this war? That is the bread and butter question that has to be answered for us ourselves as we ponder and meditate seriously on this here issue. When we look at how the war is intensified, we can look at a whole host of different matters or issues that we can use or cite to back this up. First of all, the evolution versus creation debate. Okay. Evolution has been a greatly popularized theory over the last good number of years. Charles Darwin, of course, has been the great founder of that theory. Uh, but may I suggest that it actually was, been, was around or had been around even before he came on the scene. But he's the one that certainly popularized it. And ever since Charles Darwin popularized the theory of evolution, we have had two contrasting, uh, crashing concepts, crashing ideas that are polar opposite of one another. Evolution first was taught as fact. Now we have moved from just evolution having been taught as fact to the creation view not being a valid view, not being a legitimate view. For years, we had evolution versus creation and then let democracy take over and then let whoever determines truth, let the truth be in the eye of beholder and let the truth win out. That no longer is taking place. Now, not only is evolution taught as fact, the creation view has been marginalized and minimized to such a degree that anybody who holds that view is seen or viewed upon as ridiculous, they are discredited, they are seen as illegitimate, and that it's not a valid view, it's not a real view, anybody that holds to that view um, is, is less than human or certainly well beyond a normal, uh, of what's perceived to be normal. So we have that, uh, how, uh, pardon the pun, but the evolution of that, uh, th that concept. Well, not only is there evolution taught as fact and the creation view has been minimized, but it has paved the way. Again, abortion has been around for a long time now. I understand that for a good number of years, but it has paved the way for abortion to be um, even that much more readily available, but not only readily available, it is seen as normal. And why not? Because if 
one believes in evolution and that is they don't believe in god they don't believe in intelligent design they don't believe in the uh, biblical creation account of the bible then we don't really have that serious intimate uh, unlimited incredible amount of value uh, on our lives human value is seen as something that's abstract it, it's not really valuable human life which makes abortion that much more easier to not only believe but to participate in and to support because if there isn't really intelligent design if we haven't been made and created by a loving god and if he didn't know us even before he formed us in the womb if there isn't that kind of intimate loving involvement from a loving creator then what does it matter right and that's why not only has there been abortion on demand we have gotten to be so far gone now that there is a push and actually has been uh, passed legislation has been passed in a couple of states where children can be put to death even after they have left the womb even after they have been officially born they can be put to death if unwanted so we have seen how that has transpired also the sin of homosexuality has gone from being tolerated not only tolerated but to it being celebrated it has been invited it's been popularized there's a movement going on and so while uh, before I get charged with being a big bigot and homophobic and un you know not tolerating uh, alter uh, alternative lifestyles and all of that sort of thing, I know what all of the talking points are, but the Bible has to be the bottom line. It has to have the authority, and it is the authority. And homosexuality is sin. That's why God destroyed two cities known as Sodom and Gomorrah in the book of Genesis in the Old Testament. Because the sin ran that rampant and God was that grieved over it, he had to destroy two whole cities to exterminate that great massive amount of sinfulness. And so it isn't much different now. God views that sin the same way now. He doesn't like that sin he hates all sin mind you okay it's not that i'm highlighting a particular sin over other sins all sin is bad and god judges all sin for sure but there is a movement going on within the name of homosexuality which is sinful and it not only has been tolerated now which that's the way how it was in years gone by but now it's celebrated and then we've got religious freedom where Christians have been grouped in, in, in this for, in the name of religious freedom to now there being a shift to looking to exterminate God. We, there have been uh, proclamations made to put under God out of the pledge to remove Ten Commandment uh, monuments and all of these sorts of things from years gone by. Now we are under the we it, it could be very possible that we could be censored censored in the public arena censored on social media censored on the internet censored anybody that has a christian worldview or has biblical convictions there's a great possibility there is the prospect that it is coming that we uh, may indeed be mandated to be censored or there may be um, something laid out to where we're going to look to, they're going to look to shut us up well then there's a christians uh for a time have been so fearful that they lived their lives in private it was a private christian life where we lived in secret the church has gotten to be so scared about public perception that they lived in secret they lived it privately and now we have moved from a private christian life to a compromising christian life which is even worse christians tolerating sin it makes the church at corinth in first corinthians look like a godly movement or a movement of god compared to what's going on today with how much sin has been tolerated within the church whether if it's alcoholism or foul language or a compromising of the scriptures biblical illiteracy you name it we have moved from a private christian lifestyle which was bad enough to now a compromising christian lifestyle which is even far worse so you think there's a culture war on god going on 
These things don't come about just by pure accident. These things didn't just come about over time because people got bored or they happened all on their own. It was like dumb luck. These things happen because there's a culture war on God, the church has buckled, and the secular world has gained more and more ground where it almost has seemed like they have taken over. Well, what does this mean for us who name the name of Christ? We've got a responsibility, and not just a responsibility, we should have desire from our hearts to take a stand. And that's what we're going to be about here on Keeping It Real. So I greatly encourage you to keep it here, to pay attention to the rest of the edition of this show. Right now we're going to play a tune by Hillsong United called Not Today.
culture war on God? And are we going to stand firm or are we going to cave? Are we going to stand firm as the scripture says, or will we be casualties of war? That is the essence of the show. That question right there. And we've got a core verse for this edition of the show that I've entitled The Culture War on God. The core verse is found in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, which says, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. So that is the essence of really what we're about here today, because in the verses that follow there, and we'll touch on these here and there in the remainder of this show, is there's different parts of the armor. When we talk about the armor of God, there's different parts. There's the helmet of salvation, or there's the breastplate of righteousness. There's the shield of faith. There's the sword of the spirit. There are all these different parts of the armor, and they all tie into um, knowledge of the scriptures, obedience to the scriptures. They all deal with our spiritual walk before God. And that is really where the essence is at, because that is where our success as a soldier depends on. Our success as a soldier depends on two things that we will hammer on in in this show. First of all, we're going to address the issue of protection. The armor of God is designed to protect us. The protective gear that God offers is sufficient. He doesn't give us he doesn't give us some sort of flimsy um, stuff to protect us with. It, 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 he doesn't protect us with, you know, arming us with a spitball gun. or He doesn't protect us with a Nerf gun or a plastic toy knife or something like that. He, spiritually speaking, gives us armor that is sufficient for protection. Protection against who or protection against what? Protection from the devil, primarily, of course. Protection from him and his schemes. The book of Ephesians chapter 6 talks about the wiles of the devil or the flaming arrows that the devil shoots at us. The protective armor is sufficient to, pr to protect us from all of what the devil might be up to to try and derail us, trip us up, wreak havoc in our lives. Because ultimately, as it says in the Gospel of John chapter 10, he is all about stealing, killing, and destroying. That's what he wants to do in our lives. He wants to wreak havoc. And he will use whatever circumstance, whatever person, whatever instance, he will use whatever he can to try and get at you. Believer and unbeliever alike. Satan hates people. And he will look to make your life a living nightmare any way he can. So there are reasons why the world has launched forward in their agenda. That is the world system. When I say the world, I'm talking about, or my meaning there is the world system. And just as I laid out in the introduction here today, there has been an agenda, an anti-God movement. There is a culture war on God. It hasn't taken much to be able to figure it out, but as we have now so powerfully and deeply demonstrated already within this edition of the show, we have understood that there most certainly has been an anti-God movement in any number of ways. There have been multiple spectrums, multiple stages where this anti-God movement has manifested itself. There has been a culture war on God, and we as children of God, those who have trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior for the forgiveness of sins, for the cleansing of sin, and trusted in his redemptive work on the cross, we have to be alert. We have to have this armor on, securely fastened at all times, because the devil and the world, they're, the life of sin, the way of sin is going to get at us. It constantly flies in our faces. And Unfortunately, too many have compromised, as I've laid out earlier. Not only do we have so many Christians, or we've had for, or too many Christians living private Christian lives, now we've had too many Christians living compromised Christian lives. 
tolerating sin, dipping into all kinds of arenas of sinfulness. And it has totally watered down their testimony and their message. And then when the world try, you know, when there's any par prospect of someone who doesn't know Christ, doesn't name the name of Christ, and any opportunity for them to get saved from someone that has a credible witness, it's really far-fetched because whatever Christians that they have been exposed to, they've been exposed to those that have watered down the message so much due to just an overall watered-down way of life. And here is the problem. Too many Christians have acted like spiritual possums or lived like spiritual possums. We play, we play dead. We've been like Crash and Eddie in the Ice Age movies, where a lot of times they would just pretend to be dead to avoid danger or not be exterminated. And that's the way how possums uh, generally live their lives. And too many, we've had too many spiritual possums within the church. And that has been such a problematic issue when concerning the Christian message or the Christian witness. I can break this down into any number of four ways that Christians have compromised their lifestyle. But not only just dipping into a life of sin, but it's stemmed from biblical illiteracy. It is stemmed from prayerlessness. It is stemmed from a worship extinction. And it is stemmed from just a lack of care and attention given to God or Christ in general. That has been the problem. Those tenets of the faith have been minimized to such a degree that sin, it hasn't taken much to dabble into sin. It's so unready to participate in because of the biblical illiteracy, because of the prayerlessness, because of the worship, worship extinction, and because of just a general lack of passion and care about God and having his spirit be at work in their lives. So we have been like spiritual possums. And then we have got to understand what God's protection does. This is not some Mickey Mouse subject matter. This is not a small potatoes issue. God's protection is real. And it, again, it is sufficient. It is something that is very readily available. God makes it available. And he wants us to use it. It is sufficient. And when we use it in the in right way, we apply it to our lives. That is, we apply the scriptures to our lives and we, we, we really have a passion to pray. And God, we invite God's spirit into our lives and God is taking over. He's got complete reign of our lives. That's what it means to have him as Lord, not just a savior, but as Lord of our lives. And then God takes over. And when God takes over, there is something special going on and then while people may dispute it people may resist it look to work around you work around your testimony that's okay you and i are not responsible for that but there is an undeniable truth there's an undeniable message that is there through a life that is lived in the power of the spirit of god that is the essence of this it conveys a credible message that brings us to two songs now. First by Sarah Reeves, Right Where You Want Me, and then a song called Trust by Seventh Time Down. Hope you enjoy these two tunes. <laughs> i 
y'all sticking with me here for those of you that have been watching on youtube here at kir radio live really appreciate you sticking with me and for all of you here in the local listening area listening to magic 105.5 definitely appreciate you your listening ears to keeping it real as well we've been about the culture war on god and there most certainly is a culture war on god going on and the question is are we going to stand firm or are we going to be casualties of war and believe me, Satan is looking for as many casualties of war as he can bring about. Uh, there is no question about that. And he will use whatever means to make that possible. As we've already emphasized, there is an opportunity, though, to be protected. Okay, There are two provisions of the armor of God. And one is protection. And now the other that we're going to dive into is trust. There is going to be a favorable outcome for all of us who trust in the Lord with all of our heart and need, lean not on our, on our own understanding. As it says in the book of Psalms, Psalm 34, trust in the Lord and do good, and then you will go in and out and find pasture. So trusting in God reaps great benefits, not only for the here and now, but also for the longevity of life, if there's a consistency as as it says in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, if we would be steady, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, then we know that good things are going to come about. So trust is a major player here when we consider this whole aspect of, or this whole issue of the culture war on God. A success for a soldier depends on protection and it depends on trust. That is where our success lies. Again, 
our core verse also lays this out. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Again, twice within one verse, and it says it again in an ensuing verse. Three times in this passage we have to stand in Ephesians 6. We are to stand firm, not stand with hesitancy, not stand in weakness, not stand not being sure of ourselves, not stand in a confused way. We are to stand firm. It makes it clear because God makes our success guaranteed. As long as we seek out his protection and we trust completely in him, then the favorable outcome will be there. And the reason why trust is such a difficult thing for so many of us uh, so much of the time is there there's great potential for battle scars. There's no doubt about it. And the problem is that we don't see the battle scars the way we should see them. We see battle scars as we don't want them. We want to try and avoid them. We want to try and and work our way around that thing any which way we can. But a lot of times, the battle scars are by design. God's design. God desires us to accumulate battle scars. Why is that? Why does he allow brokenness in our lives? Why does he allow certain seasons in our lives where it just seems like everything's falling apart and we feel like there's no hope and then God restores us. He reaches deep within our in our souls, in the core of our beings and he restores those broken pieces and he mends them together again and makes us stronger than we ever were. And then we have a great story to tell, a great testimony. That's what God is after. And the, so the resistance to the battle scars is not what God wants. God wants us to be accepting of those things. It's not to say that we just sit around and go, well, yeah, just keep bringing on the battle scars. No, we certainly want joy in our lives. We want those victorious moments. We, we don't uh, welcome battle scars necessarily with a boastful spirit or just with a nonchalant way about us. But we are to, when the battle scars come and they, it's inevitable that they have come into our lives, we are to embrace them because God is up to something. He's always working. And that's what the, those times of battle scars are the times that God uses to mold us and furnish us and shape us more and more into his image. And then that gets us shining all the more brightly and gives us even a brighter message for a lost and dying world. So it is within God's design. So why is the trust factor so difficult? Because of that reason, but also because we are afraid of the world, right? Listen, public perception, it means, we could talk about how it doesn't mean anything. And in the grand scheme of things, our attitude should be that it doesn't mean that much of anything. A lot of times I know that that's the way I feel. Chances are many of you that really love the Lord have felt that way too. But listen, a lot of times we get weak. Our, our, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, right? And we get susceptible to valuing public opinion. We care about what other people think sometimes, right? And when the world sees us as a trusting Christian, they perceive us as weak. There's a perceived weakness on their part of us. They see It's kind of like a great white shark that smells blood in the water. They see someone that they could take advantage of, somebody that they can belittle, somebody that they can kind of have a little fun with. And what we need to do is relinquish control. That needs to be our response to that. Relinquish control. What do I mean about, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is stop. We, you and I have to stop grabbing the bull by the horns and being in control or wanting control in the matter. We ought to yield ourselves over to the leading of the Lord and allow him to govern our lives. That's what Jesus was after when he said in the Gospel of Luke, deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow me. That is, deny yourself. Have a spirit of selflessness. Relinquish control. The more you relinquish control, you let God take control of the situation. Not only will God have control of your life, 
and your actions, but he will be in control of the situation, which would include being in control of those that persecute you or ridicule you as well. So that is the element of trust. God is after our spiritual success, and it comes in two ways. When we seek out his protection and when we seek him out with a trusting heart. Those two things have got to be there. And that is the essence of this song that we're going to play now by Skillet called Anchor. Drifting beneath the horizon Body's weak but I'm trying To make it to shore But I'm falling short I need you more Wave after wave I've been sinking So unto your promise I'm clinging You say that I'm strong To you of war. Well, what does a casualty of war look like? We've talked a lot about what it takes to have success or gain the victory in this war. What about uh, a casualty? What does that look like? And then again, after all, there have been so many of them. Because again, it's not just that so many Christians have lived private Christian lives, as we've emphasized, but there's been this shift to where so many Christians have compromised uh, their faith through uh, living a, a life of sin, being content with sin, being unrepentant of sin. Well, what does that look like? What it does is it, 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 it spoils a testimony. It's kind of like having a great wildflower arrangement that looks incredibly beautiful, and then to have um, 
just a bunch of mud thrown on those flowers, buried in dirt, or having some uh, a beautiful painting, uh, a finished product looks beautiful, a great work of art, and then for somebody to spill um, a massive amount of soda all over it. That's kind of what it looks like. And that is why the church, I believe, and I say this from a spirit of conviction, I believe that the church has been, by and large, not very impacting, has not made the kind of headway that we should have been making, that we could have been making, had we lived uncompromised, devoted lives to the Lord, and having lives that has our light shining so brightly in the light of love. That has been missing so greatly due to biblical illiteracy, prayerlessness, a worship extinction, and just a general lack of care and attention given to a want, a desire to live for the Lord. That's what a casualty of war looks like. Well, what's in it for the one who stands firm? Well, I can't promise riches. I can't, you know, I can't promise a padded bank account. And chances are that's not going to happen. It could happen. And if it does, great. Uh, but I can't promise just an overwhelming amount of security. In fact, it probably is going to make you a bit more uh, not secure than secure because, again, if you live a real devoted life for the Lord, you're going to be targeted. At one point in time or another, chances are, especially with everything that's going on, and if you you know, paid attention to this ministry outlet known as Keeping It Real, you know that this culture war on God isn't really an isolated message. There have been other messages within this outlet that have proclaimed the truth very boldly, and there is a time coming where we are going to be ridiculed even more than what we have been. And when I say we, I'm talking about people who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, born-again Christians. So what's in it for us? If it's not a padded bank account, if it's not security, if it's not um, you know, an all-expenses-paid vacation, if it's not uh, you know, a provision of resources, what is it? Love, joy, peace, goodness, patience, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. That should sound familiar for all of you who name Christ. It's the passage on the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. Those things are more valuable than any $100 million bank account. That is the essence of the Christian life. And not only are we blessed with that personally, but that blessing will radiate. It will shine forth. And make an impression on others. It may turn some some people's eyes to Jesus. It may not reach anyone for the gospel of Christ or for the kingdom of God, ultimately. But again, we're not in charge of the results. We're in charge of our own personal lives. And again, if there's love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, self-control... And against such there is no law. That's where we want to dwell. That's what we want to. We want that place to be called home. Living in the spirit. That is what's in it for us. When we stand firm. Because again. As it says in Ephesians 6.13. Therefore put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes. You may be able to stand. Your ground. And after you've done everything. To stand. Stand firm with the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the shoes of peace. Stand firm. And for all of you out there that don't know Christ, how could you not want to be in Christ and enjoy this incredible life known as the spirit-filled life, known as a life of the redeemed, known as a life of having a promised reserved home in the kingdom of heaven? known as a life where you can be safe and secure from all alarms. What a blessing this life known as the Christian life is. There is a culture war on God. Which side of the, the, the battlefield are you on? Are you on the side of the redeemed? Or are you on the side of those that oppose the redeemed and ultimately oppose God? 
Why not accept Christ as Savior and be in the family of God? Now I'm going to close out the show with a tune called Unstoppable by Matty Mullins and Jordan Feliz. And I greatly encourage you all, if you've enjoyed what you've heard here today on Keeping It Real, I greatly encourage you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, KIR Radio Live, and you can listen to any past edition of the show that you may have missed. Hope to see you back here again for the next edition of Keeping It Real.